on a balcony of space stepped a pure and holy God and in awesome solitude he stood alone not one faint star to give him light just endless rolling blackest night but somehow through the darkness he could see Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm not sure about the rest of you in trying to make a video, but um, here is another attempt 
for you this morning and uh, we just want to make this an amazing event and that uh, you will all be able to enjoy and on behalf of the TVA Baptist Women Executive we just want to welcome you and uh, we are so happy that you can join with us this morning and if you have a pen and paper ready there will be some information that you might want to take down and we don't want you to miss that information but we have um, and are very excited to bring to you this morning a great event and uh, you're going to listen to some beautiful music and uh, a devotional by Shirley Vazilis and uh, music by Sue Gerard and uh, our uh, ministry from Wendy Donuts, which everybody really enjoys. And our special speaker this morning, who is Helena Bergen from the CBWOQ. And we are excited to have her to be part of our TVA Fall Wrap. Um, she has just recently started with the CBWOQ. And uh, we are excited that she has agreed to be our speaker this morning. And I know that you will enjoy her. And so I'm going to ask Joan Peacock. And uh, even though she's moved to Nova Scotia, she is still part of our TVA Baptist Women. And uh, Joan... Thank you very much for opening up this morning in prayer. God bless you. Good morning. Welcome from Amherst, Nova Scotia. As I'm sure most of you know, my name is Joan Peacock. Brian and I moved to Nova Scotia at the end of July. In the video, you can see the Bay of Fundy and windmills. These are in just in our backyard. I am so glad the executive still included me in being a part of this meeting. My heart is still with Baptist women. And I'd like to tell you about three programs that I think are very, very important. The first is COMPLETE. COMPLETE is a transformational discipline program for women of any age or stage. Do you long for an ever-deepening relationship with Jesus that sustains you in every season of life? Do you want to experience the ongoing support of a simple, faithful, supportive community in which to grow together and discern God's voice? Do you want relationships that will launch you into new ideas, new growth, and produce real fruitfulness for the kingdom? Baptist Women believes God wants this for you too. And if this sounds like you, then would you consider joining us for the second season of Complete? For more information, see baptistwomen.com resources. The second program is Soul Sisters. I've been involved with us Soul Sisters so for quite a while. The goal of Soul Sisters is to create opportunities where it feels natural to talk about your personal walk with God. 
It is a chance to minister to each other by becoming more relaxed listeners. It gives you a chance to draw closer to God with some spiritual practices that may be new to you. They are silence, praying scripture, listening for what God may be saying, and the ancient practice of examine. If you want more information, see baptistwomen.com slash resources. And the last program I want to talk to you about is Uptick. Uptick Baptist Women is a 10-month experience for young female leaders with a heart for Jesus as they serve and mobilize their communities. Uptick Baptist Women focuses on building healthy discipline cultures while tending to spiritual and personal growth and discovery in both online and in-person contexts. Participants receive teaching on healthy life and kingdom practices through discipleship huddles and are given opportunities to build their kingdom network and relational capital by coordinating with leaders and ministries in and beyond Baptist women. Again, if you want more information, see baptistwomen.com slash resources. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our time today. Your presence is so welcome here. Help us, to I pray, to hunger and thirst for the wholeness you have for us. Thank you, gracious God for your steadfast love and patience with us. Open our hearts and spirits to what you want to say to us in this meeting. I thank you for Baptist women of Ontario and Quebec for the work that has been done for you over the last 140 years. Be with Helena as she leads us into the future. Be with each one of us right now. We ask this all in thy name. Amen. Welcome this day to our time of worship by music. But first, Brenda Mann and I will read a paraphrase of Psalm 107 by James Taylor. God could easily turn a summer day into a blizzard, a wedding celebration into a funeral, a placid pond into quicksand, a family reunion into a civil war. But God does not do such things. God's love never wavers. God turns sandboxes into gardens and slums into communities of joy. In God's intended world, foxes have holes, birds have nests, and refugees have roofs over their heads. Fields are free to forage in, and trees bend over with fruit. Ocean shoals abound with cod and scallops. In God's intended world, all creatures live in harmony with each other. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. Let them remember that God's love never wavers. Join us now in Great is Thy Faithfulness.
is Pam King, and I am treasurer of Trent Valley Baptist Women. I live in Coburg. When we were meeting in person at our spring celebration in Fall Wrap, we honored our Heavenly Father by giving back some of the great blessings and bounty He bestows on us. With that in mind, we would like you to share in our ministry. The money received is used, one, to display defray expenses by Trent Valley Baptist Women Executive, which includes technical support, supplies, postage, etc. We make a donation also to CBWOQ to support their special project. Therefore, we ask for your help. Our special project at this time is to empower the Mising people in Adam, India. CBWOQ has committed to completely fund this project, $20,000. This holistic project is a loving way to introduce Christ to a poor, largely unreached tribe in Assam, India. It provides a full suite of activities, everything from educating children to providing vocational training for the unemployed. Participants can choose computer or mechanical training, or they can learn tailoring, weaving, or knitting. This provides income for participants and a valuable source of locally made products for the community. The local church facilitates everything, creating long-term relationships. Even during COVID, seven youth started computer training, four girls were enrolled in the tailoring classes, and 15 women received weaving materials and created projects to tell, sell as soon as markets reopened. By November, the tailoring center was open again and all classes were functioning. Christ feels the pain of those who suffer, but that also means he feels their relief. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Matthew 25, 40. Giving to the poor is our opportunity to minister to Christ himself. You can read more about the Mising people on page 20 and 21 of the September-October issue of the Live magazine. If you would like to support both initiatives, please write a check to Trent Valley Baptist Women, written in full. This should be sent to me, Pam King, 207 125 3rd Street, Coburg, K9A 5W9. That's Pam King, 207 125 3rd Street, Coburg, Ontario, K9A 5W9. Please indicate how much you are de donating to TVDABW and how much to the CBWOQ special project and then the total amount. I will send one check to CBWOQ for the total amount allocated by everyone to this special project. Donations over $20 will be received by CBWOQ. If you wish to contribute to the special project only, please send a check made out to Canadian Baptist Women of Ontario and Quebec written out in full. This can be sent to CBWOQ 5 International Boulevard, Etobicoke, Ontario, M9W6H3. That's CBWOQ 5 International Boulevard, Etobicoke, Ontario, M9W6H3 or you can go to baptistwomen.com. Also click on the three little lines and uh, you will get more options. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts for the many blessings that you have showered upon us. We thank you that we are able to give back to help those not as fortunate as we are. We pray for guidance as we consider our giving and the careful use of these offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Hello, my name is Thea Dunk. On Monday, November the 1st, at the Baptist World Alliance Women's World Day of Prayer, Courageous Life, based on Hebrews 13, 6, and will be on Zoom. Informational link to join will be sent out in the week before. All information will be also be in the Live Magazine, September, October edition. The Great Canadian Bible Study will be held again in January 2022, Titus's Call to Women. The focus is on relationships and how women mentor and encourage other women. Baptist Women's Spring Conference, April 28th to 23rd, 2022, will be online again this year. Do hope you'll be able to join us at some of these events. Thank you. Hello, dear friends and sisters in Christ. I'm Patty Carpenter, your Live Magazine representative. It is really a pleasure to join with you virtually today, although personally I can't wait till we can meet in person to worship and praise our Heavenly Father at our spring celebrations and fall wraps. And of course, enjoying food and coffee together, which we have missed for too long. So I'm hoping and praying that it won't be much longer. It is a joy for me to speak to you about Live Magazine. It is a wonderful magazine full of detailed content and it is a spiritual walk each and every article that you read. It is well written, well planned out. So I know a number of you already have subscriptions and I'm thanking you for your continued support. But for those of you that don't, I really encourage you to think about getting a subscription. I can guarantee that you will not be disappointed. Subscriptions are individual at $20 direct or through your church promoter. You can phone 416-620-2954 or email live at baptist.ca. We as Baptist women and leaders are truly worthy and valued by God. Each of us comes to God's ministry with a different gift. Thank you for sharing this time with me and take care. And a good favorite now is I Know Who Holds Tomorrow.
today the title of my devotion is God's Treasure Chest. Everyone likes to find a treasure. Treasures come in different ways for each people, a person. Treasures can be special. Things received from your children, jewelry, etc., etc. These are usually kept in special boxes in places and shared with others at some time. These are all material treasures, but I'm talking today about a special treasure, that a treasure chest given to us by God. Now, the treasure definition and meaning in the Collins English Dictionary is if you treasure something that you have, keep it and care for it carefully, it gives you great pleasure and you think of it as very special. So, what is this treasure chest that we're talking about today? I'm sure you have guessed by now, it is your Bible. Psalm 119, verse 162 says, I rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. So do you treat the word as a special treasure from God? How often do you open this treasure chest? How often? Do you share its contents? So again, this treasure chest is the Bible, God's holy word. Do you rejoice in God's word like a treasure? Or is it just something you do when you feel like it? If it was taken away from you, would you miss it? God's word is the treasure box for our lives. Psalm 119, 116. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Are you hiding these special treasures in your heart to remind you to worship God only? We can memorize verses or write special verses down and put them in a treasure box to bring out and remind us of what God's word has shown us. The Psalms are full of special treasure verses. Don't leave your Bible closed, as most treasure boxes are. Open it daily and let it fill your mind and soul with the treasures found in it. Treasure your Bible, because in some countries, they are not allowed. I read in the Open Doors prayer sheet that in Brunei, it is hard to obtain a Bible especially in their local native language, because Bibles are not allowed to be sold in their country. Native believers there long to own Bible in their language. Could you live without your Bible? Is it your treasure chest of God's word? Or is it another dust collector on a book on the shelf? Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is it? Does God's word direct your life? Acts 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. How often do you sing praises and thank God for his wonderful treasure chest? The following is a hymn. I will read it. Thy word is like a garden, Lord, with flowers bright and fair, and everyone who seeks may pluck a lovely cluster there. Thy word is like a deep, deep mine, and jewels, rich and rare, are hidden in the mighty depths for every searcher there. Thy word is like a starry host, a thousand rays of light, a sun to guide the traveler and make his pathway bright. Oh, may I love thy precious word. May I explore the mine. May I the fragrant flowers gleam, may light upon me shine. 
So search through the scriptures to find these treasures. The Lord gives us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, but he cannot give it if we do not open the treasure chest, his word, the Bible, and take it into our hearts and put it into practice. Open it, dig for treasures. You will not be disappointed, but you will be rejoicing and wanting to share the treasures that you find. So open it up, dig for treasures, and take them into your heart and minds. Thanking God for these rich treasures that you have found. <clears throat> three, three special treasure verses that I want to leave with you today that you can, or you can dig also for your own. Psalm 121, verse one and two. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. And then Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. These two verses are my very favorite treasures. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So get busy. Start digging into God's treasure chest to find your own treasures and blessings from his holy word, the Bible. Amen. Hey! 
just want to thank you on behalf of all the Baptist women who have joined us this morning. Thank you for being our speaker and for what uh, the Lord has laid in your heart that you're going to share with us this morning. I know that uh, you have a great interest in Baptist women and our history and uh, so we look forward to hearing from you in the future not only this morning but uh, everything that uh, you are learning and everything that you want to share from your heart. I know that God has his hand on you and I know that you are the woman for today for us as Baptist women and so we just look forward to hearing from you this morning as what God has led in your heart and I know you would share with the woman a little bit about yourself. So um, I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to give it all to you, Helena. So God bless you and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. God bless. Hi, everyone. I'm Helena Bergen. And I'm the new executive director of Canadian Baptist Women of Ontario and Quebec. And I am very excited and honored to be able to share this day with you. I would really have liked to have been there in person. And I'm kind of sad that I'm not. But I trust God that he is going to bless this time together regardless of how we are gathered. And I sure hope that we will be able to meet in person at some point in the future. So I've come to this role with Baptist Women at a pretty exciting time. I have shared in a previous video that some of you have seen on our website uh, or on social media um, about a promise, where I am speaking about a promise that I believe that God has given to us. It is a promise that we have come into a time in which there's going to be, in which God's going to do a special work. There's going to be a reaping in Baptist women. Uh, this reaping is the result of the hard work and the faithfulness of others that have sown for years. Now, I do not know how or what this reaping will look like because that's God's work. But there are a few things that God has been impressing on me over the years, a vision and an understanding that he has been shaping inside of me. And I believe he was doing it in preparing me for this role. I want to unpack part of it here today because I'm hearing echoes of it, <clears throat> of this vision all around me. And it is uncanny how this thing that God's been shaping in me aligns with the mission and vision of Baptist women. You know, Baptist women's mission is to facilitate authentic experience of God and intimate connection with mission. These are the things that shape everything that we do. Facilitating experiential, genuine, real, original to you and I relationship with God. And then out of this, an intimate connection to mission. That is the mission of God that is all around us, at our doorsteps, in our neighborhoods, in every part of the world. It is his mission, it is God's mission to redeem and restore and reconcile all that he has made to himself. And there's a lot to cover in this mission statement of Baptist women. So after trying to cover the whole thing in one shot, I decided I can't do that. There's just too much. And so I'm going to just focus today on the first part of this, 
a mission statement, and that is authentic experience of God. You know, the more I have thought about authentic experience of God, the more that I can't help but believe that there is an alignment, there's a connection between this and the promise of reaping that I believe God has spoken to me about. And I will get back to this a little bit later on in this talk. So let's dive in. And before we begin, let's pray. God, I do pray right now that you would meet each one of us wherever we are today in ways that are truly authentic and personal because your word reveals to us that this is the kind of God that you are. God, would you meet us in the stories that I'm sharing? Would you meet us in the scriptures that we're going to be looking at? Would you help us to be willing and open to receive you in whatever way you choose to reveal yourself? Would you help us to see you today? God, encourage, comfort, strengthen, bring us into your presence. And God, yes, I do ask for that you would bring conviction to because you are good and we can trust you in it. You are always good. We trust you in all things. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. So I'm actually going to start today with a story that my father shared with me in his last year on this earth. <clears throat> At this time, there was a dark cloud of, of a cancer diagnosis hanging over his head. And after a lifetime of serving as a minister, he was really grappling with his beliefs about God. In the church that he serves, and the one that I grew up in, was a traditional Mennonite church. Now, we did live in modern homes with electricity and running water, and we did drive cars, uh, and I did attend a public school and all that stuff. But there were definitely many markers within this group that identified the people as being true and faithful adherents of the church and a true Mennonite. And, is often, and as is often the case, there is not a lot of distinction between what was faith and what was cultural. Hairstyles were a big item, and they still are to this day. So for men, it was pretty much 90% guaranteed that you, were, if you were, that you were a good, true, faithful Mennonite who was in good standing with the church and the community, if you had, one, recited the catechism in front of the congregation as a young adult, two, if you had gone, undergone baptism by sprinkling after reciting the catechism. Three, if your face was clean shaven and your hair was clipped short. And four, if you frequently enjoyed a dinner of pierogies and farmer sausage. And five, if your last name was Gunther, Thiessen, or Giesbrecht. I am not even joking about this stuff. In his retired years, my father pursued a lifelong interest. He picked up a seasonal job to drive a big truck and he made deliveries of produce in the greater Toronto area. So on one such trip, my father found himself in heavy traffic in a heavy rain on one of the 400 series highways. He got quite uh, flustered about where his exit was, whether he had missed it or not, and uh, navigating through you know, eight lanes of heavy traffic, bumper to bumper in the rain, made it all the more disorienting. And, and he ended up actually having a minor collision with another vehicle, which of course only snowballed his stress. So he, by the time he got out of the truck, he was in a near panic. And you know, his concern was that as an elderly driver that he might has, have his license revoked. And he truly, truly treasured his independence and his ability to drive and could not imagine what life would be like if this was uh, um, revoked from him. But as he climbed out, he managed to pull his truck over to, this, over to the side of the highway and so did the other vehicle. And they both climbed out. And uh, my father was in a terrible state. Um, but as the other driver climbed out, my father took note that this was a younger man who was not clean shaven. According to my father, he had long bushy hair, a full mustache, and <clears throat> a beard to match. So my shaking father began to apologize profusely. He began to explain himself to death, and he began to fret about calling the police. 
The other man obviously took note of my father's distress, but he calmly circled the vehicles. He inspected the damages. Then he came back to my father, friendly, relaxed, unfazed. Not too much damage, he said. But hey, look here. I have a question for you. Look at the sky. Look at those trees. The sky? The trees? What in the world? I just crashed my truck into your car, pal. But no, take a look around. Look at this wonderful world around us. Do you believe that at all, that all this is here by accident? Or do you think that maybe there is a good God who looks after us? My father stood there in absolute disbelief as this man reached out his hand and they shook hands and he told him to have a good day. Now, as my father was relaying this story to me, he was still feeling his relief so profoundly and recalling the grace and generosity of this man so keenly that his eyes welled up in tears. And with all seriousness, he asked me, is it possible that this man could have been a real Christian? You know, the reason I'm telling this story is because we all have ideas about what, it, about what marks a real Christian, don't we? We all like to have a framework of evidences, those identifiers for ourselves, and also so that we can identify others who are in the same camps as us. They might not include the same markers of the Mennonite community that I grew up in, but I believe they are there all the same. My father has hit, had my father had his ideas, his set of identifiers, and he was really hung up on them. But as far fetched as they might be from ours, I think we can get hung up on ours too. When you read the gospel stories, it doesn't take long to discover that this is a common human trait. There were many things that the Jewish people held on to as identifiers and evidence of their rightness with God. They had their Sabbaths, they had their festivals, they had their customs, they had their religious rites, they had their titles, uh, their systems, their religious systems, they had their sacred sites, they had their ancestry. When Jesus came along, he began challenging these leaders on these things. And not surprisingly, they took offense. They were almost <clears throat> always at odds with him and irate. Like how dare Jesus heal someone on a day when there were strict rules about working. They were so furious that several times they sought to kill him. And you know, we know how the, we know the story. In the end, they did just that. But when we read the Gospels, especially the book of John, there's another group of people that I believe we're invited to um, consider. And they are in contrast to those who hold tightly to their religious identifiers. They are the ones who, in spite of their religious beliefs and convictions, are drawn to Jesus and into the circle of light that he casts. There's something about him that has piqued their interests. And so they hang out with him. They stick close to him. They listen to the things that he says, to his teachings. They ask him questions when they don't understand. They take note of the things that he does and how he treats people. They consider the incredible claims that he makes about himself, about who he is, his identity. They are perplexed. They're confused. At times they're offended. But they circle over and over around the questions about who Jesus is, actually. The writer of John is not in a rush to answer these questions, though. Jesus' identity is a big one, and arriving at answers <clears throat> is a journey. Getting to know Jesus is a journey. The questions will be answered in time if the people keep asking them and do not walk away if they keep tracking with Jesus, if they take note of the evidences that he pre presents to substantiate his claims about himself, if they stay in the light and do not retreat from it, regardless of how piercing that light becomes. It is only at the end of this book that the writer says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, 
you may have life in his name. Believing is a journey. But you know, the answers that these people arrive at are not just intellectual. They're not just knowledge that they store up in the brain. The folks who do remain with their questions, who do continue to search for answers about who Jesus is, they eventually experience who he is for themselves. And their experience with him is nothing short of transformational, like radically transformational. There's one person that I'd like to look at today who exemplifies this in whom we see this happening. And that is the Samaritan woman who Jesus encounters at the well in Samaria. So this story is found in the fourth chapter of John. And I'm sure that many of you who are listening here today have heard lots of messages uh, that detail different aspects of this story. But what I want to focus on today here is that this woman also came to Jesus with her set of, a, of religious identifiers. Those things that provided a framework for her of, I'm good with God. And we'll see how these religious identifiers were really a cover-up, a way for her to deflect from her true, very broken state of being. So if you're here today and you're joining in as someone who's not familiar with this story, first of all, let me say I'm really glad that you're here. You are so welcome. Uh, secondly, um, let me just say that this story is found in the fourth chapter in the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book in the New Testament portion of the Bible. So if you're not familiar with how to get around the Bible, that's perfectly okay. Just Google John 4 and I believe you will land there. So the narrative goes like this. Jesus and his group of disciples are traveling through the ancient region of Palestine from the area of Judea to Galilee. So their direct route, their direct route is through this region called Samaria. Around noon, Jesus' group makes a pit stop. The disciples head off to a nearby Samaritan town. Um, they're going off to get food while Jesus takes a rest. He sits down at this place called Jacob's Well. And this is a significant cultural and religious landmark for both the Jews and the Samaritans. And while Jesus rests there, a lone woman comes to draw water. Now, even though the Jews and the Samaritans shared a common ancestry, and even though they worshiped the same God, and even though they shared the same text, sacred texts, they were hostile to each other, and they actually despised each other's places of worship. One commentary that I read as I was preparing for this said that we might compare the tensions between the Jews and Samaritans to tensions in segregated America in the 1950s or apartheid in Africa in the 1980s. So this woman who is coming to draw water is rightfully startled when Jesus initiates a conversation with her and asks her to draw some water for him from this well. But she is shocked, not only because of the Jew-Samaritan tensions, but also because this is not something that Jewish men did. Jewish men were taught to limit interactions even with Jewish women. Engaging a Samaritan woman in a conversation, especially one like this, was very much beneath Jewish men. It was just not done. How is it, she asks, that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jesus answers her question with a very evocative and mysterious statement. If you knew the gift of God, he says, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In the exchange that follows, the woman asks more questions, and we can see that she does not get what Jesus is saying. The well where they are standing is deep, she says, and Jesus has nothing to draw the water out with. So where do you get this living water, she wants to know. Again, Jesus is mysterious, and he says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. But 
But again, this woman misunderstands Jesus, and again she takes him literally. Sir, she says, give me this water so that I don't have to be ever be thirsty again or ever have to come here <clears throat> excuse me, to draw water again. Now, when I read this, <clears throat> I feel a sense of frustration building up that A, she's not getting this, and B, <clears throat> that Jesus is not communicating clearly. And what I really want to know at this point is one, will she realize who Jesus is? Will she understand who it is that is making this crazy offer of living water? And two, will she ask him for the gift? Will she receive the living water? I really want her to get it. And I want her to find out what this living water is. But the suspense really ramps up at what Jesus says next. Go, he says, call your husband and come here. Now, for those of you who are familiar with this story, you already know that this is heading in a very personal direction. And Jesus is treading on a personal landmine here with this woman. You know, she's a person, she's a woman who has a lot of skeletons in her closet. She's been through five husbands. And right now she's with a sixth man who isn't actually her husband. You know, I don't think that this is a method that I would use to establish rapport with someone but Jesus never does the thing that we expect him to. But can you imagine what may have been running at her mind at this point? What would have been running through your mind? Did she turn her face away to hide her expression of discomfort? Did her breathing suddenly become a bit more shallow? Did her heart rate pick up a little bit? Did the color start to burn in her cheeks? Go, call your husband. Jesus puts his finger on her most tender place, her sin, her secret, her shame, her pain. How will she respond to Jesus' request? Will she remain in the light that Jesus casts? Will she risk having her sin and shame exposed by this light? Will she be honest with him? Will she have the courage to stay in the light? Or will she retreat? Will she turn away like many other individuals in the New Testament stories who found Jesus too challenging, too uncomfortable, too offensive, too demanding? Because you know, that was a very real option for her, just as it is for you and I when things get uncomfortable. Well, you know, she does muster up her courage. She does not walk away. She chooses to stay in the light. And she continues to engage with Jesus, even though her answer is short and it's curt. She doesn't reveal too much. I don't have a husband, she says. But in Jesus' next statement, she finds out that he already knows all about her anyway. You're right, he says. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not actually your husband. You know, though it might seem that way, I don't believe that Jesus was rubbing salt into her wounds. Right here in this place, Jesus was inviting her to engage with him in a very real way so that she could experience his living water in a very real way, in the very depths of her being. You know, she didn't need any more religious identifiers. She needed what Jesus had the power to give. The living water that Jesus offered had the power to deal with her sin, to cast off her shame, to wash her and cleanse her and make her new and whole, to set her free. But in order for her to continue with Jesus, to receive what was being offered, there had to be an admission of her brokenness she had to give Jesus access to it. You know, the thing that this woman does next is so interesting, and it puts another plot twist into this story. And I think it's something we all have the tendency to resort to, and I've already alluded, alluded to this. She deflects the conversation, and she takes religious cover. She starts pointing out to all her religious props, the, the traditions, the customs, the sacred places of the Samaritans. 
But you know, Jesus does not allow his presence to be invalidated by any claims to culture, tradition, or history. I think we need to hear this again. Jesus does not allow his presence to be invalidated by any claims to culture, tradition, or history. In spirit and in truth is how we must come to him, worship him. Jesus says in spirit and in truth. The other stuff have, may have a place somewhere in this woman's life, but there is no substitute for her in coming to Jesus as he insists that she, that she come to him. She has to lay down her religious identifiers. She has to allow her true, genuine, broken self to be brought into Jesus' light. In this posture, she's able to receive his gift of living water. That is his very presence, his light, his hope. The stains of all her sins and the sins that others have committed against her are all washed away. In receiving living water, she enters into a life that is eternal in quality and in quantity. A life that is marked with a joy of knowing that she is loved, profoundly so. She is no longer an outcast. She belongs where it counts the most. You know, the ashes of her life have been traded for beauty and a life of purpose, a life of freedom, a life in which physical death is but a gateway into glory, transformed indeed. You know, we have to get this. There's no substitute for an authentic experience. When the Samaritan woman goes back to her community, she invites them to come and see, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Her faith is not secondary. It comes from having experienced Jesus for herself. And now she can say to others, come and see for yourselves. You know, my father was in his 83rd year when he left this life. He lived by his religious beliefs without questioning them for most of these years. But as I mentioned in my story at the beginning of my talk, he really began to wrestle later on in life. The wrestling intensified with his cancer diagnosis. You know, and the weaker he became in his body, the stronger his need grew for real answers and for his own very real, authentic, and personal experience with God. He needed to know for himself that there was a remedy for his sin, for his brokenness that he had not yet experienced. You know, praise God, he received it. It was a Monday afternoon and my brother and I were sitting by his hospital bed while a wise minister read <clears throat> and explained the scriptures to him and prayed with him. And it took about two hours. But it was in this time that my father was finally able to lay down all his religious identifiers and he was able to allow the light of Jesus in and he received the gift of living water. He began to praise God with every breath and with every ounce of strength remaining to him. Over and over, he said, we have to give God thanks. He has done so much for us. We have no idea how much he has done. We have to give God thanks. Every single breath to every single visitor who came to his bedside. We have to give God thanks. You know, two days later, he was gone from us. Psalm 146, one to two says, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. You know, whether the rest of our lives are two days like my father's or five years or 60 years, God is so worthy of every breath being offered in undiluted praise because he is that glorious.
At the beginning of this talk, I speculated that possibly there is a connection between the reaping that God has promised, the work that he is preparing to do, and these things that he um, has etched so deeply on my, sh on my heart, some of what I'm sharing here today. So I want to go back to this thought. Where might the connection be between our own authentic experience with Jesus and a reaping, a harvest, a work that God wants to do? Is there a connection? Well, let's look back to the story in John <clears throat> chapter 4. You know, in her excitement over her experience with Jesus, this Samaritan woman leaves her water jug at the well and she hurries back to town. So let's remember that these are the people who know this woman as the immoral one, the loose one. She's the outcast. Normally, her words would hold no weight. They would be of no consequence. But now there's a different quality to them. Now, for some reason, <clears throat> she has everyone's attention. Come and see, she calls out. Come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Christ, the Messiah? You know, people probably don't need more information about Jesus. When they encounter someone who is full to the brim with living water, whose joy cannot be contained, they only need to come and have their own experience with Jesus. You know, this was me when I had my first encounter with Jesus. <clears throat> The magnitude of what had happened to me caused me to talk to everyone. And it, it was this amazing thing, and I could not stop talking about it. It's all that I talked about. The people around me were like the townspeople in this story. They began to come and see for themselves, and they began to have their own experiences of Jesus too. You know, in a matter of months, <clears throat> many of my family members and friends were filling the pews in the little church that I was attending and the pews of other churches in the area. And they were getting baptized and the like. Just come and see, come and see. You know, as Jesus talks to his disciples about the harvest that is ready to be gathered in, the townspeople are already making their way out to meet Jesus for themselves. They get their own authentic experience. We no longer believe just because of what you said, they tell this woman. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. There is no substitute for a firsthand, authentic experience and encounter with Jesus. I don't know where you find yourself in this story today. Maybe you resonate with just one thing or two or three. Maybe you are the come and see person here today and you are nodding. And you are nodding your head and joy is springing up inside of you because you already drink deeply of this living water and you know that this well never runs dry because you've tested it and tried it. Praise God. Come and see indeed. But maybe you're here because someone who has a come and see kind of relationship with Jesus has invited you because they want you to come and see for yourself. They want you to know this wonderful giver of living water for yourself. Now, if this is you, I truly hope that your interest has been roused enough that you will do more investigating. I hope that you are thirsty for this water. And I hope that you have a sense of there being a parchment in your soul. You know, when it gets personal, I pray that you will not draw back, that you will have the courage that the Samaritan woman demonstrated. I pray that you will stay, that you will let the light shine in, and that you will have your own encounter with, an encounter with Jesus. I guarantee you 10,000% you will never regret it. Come and see. But perhaps you relate to the Samaritan woman as someone who uses religious identifiers as a shield or to assure yourself that you're good. You convince yourself that you're a good Christian 
because you're able to check all the boxes. You know, the boxes are not always bad in themselves. Yes, there are definitely some very bad, harmful, destructive religious practices and, and ideas, but spending time in, in the scriptures and praying regularly is a very good thing. Joining in, wor in worship with your family of faith regularly is also a very good thing. Demonstrating your trust in God um, in his provision by honoring him with your giving is good. Active concern for the plight of the people around this world is also very good. But it is when they are done from an overflow of love for Jesus and others that they count in God's books. But you know what? God's not looking for you to check boxes. And if we're judging our good standing with God and others too, by how many boxes we can check, well, we've missed it. Just like my father missed it for so many years. Remember, Jesus does not allow his presence to be invalidated by any claims to culture, tradition, history, nor checked boxes. There's no substitute for his presence. He insists that we too must give up the idea that we are okay based on our religious identifiers. We too must be willing to lay them down and enter into an authentic relationship with him. If this is you today, do you have the courage to do so? I pray that you do. Come and see. But perhaps you relate more to the woman, <clears throat> to this Samaritan woman's brokenness. Maybe there's a weight of pain and shame that hangs around your neck like a heavy rock. It could be the terrible things that other people have done to you. Or they could be the things that you have done that you can't forgive yourself for. Maybe you have had a painful label placed on you that you can't seem to shake and that continually haunts you. I'm glad you're here and I pray you too have the courage to stay within this circle of light that Jesus casts. That you have the courage to be real with him. That you allow him access to those most vulnerable parts of you today. Because he is good. He is always gentle. His presence is a healing presence. You can trust him with these parts of yourself and you can trust him to bring freedom and healing to these places. I invite you to come and see. You know, there are many other things that challenge faith in Jesus, that sap our joy, <clears throat> our confidence in God's careful watch over our lives. Perhaps you once had a come and see faith that has now run dry, run dry by distractions, maybe by mundane things or hard things, disappointments, disillusionments, dreams that never manifested, betrayal by someone you trusted, perhaps by too much loss, loss of relationship, loss of a loved one, loss of health, Loss of financial security. There are lots of types of losses, aren't there? But you know, God operates in a very <clears throat> special kind of economy in which nothing that is brought to him is ever wasted. He is willing to restore us and he can use every bit of what we have experienced for our good and for his glory. So I invite you to, to come Come and bring all this stuff into his light. Come and see. Come and see. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you offer to every single one of us living water that springs up into eternal life. Eternal life that begins in a beautiful journey of knowing you in this life. I pray for all who are listening to this today that as they draw near to you, hungry for their own genuine and authentic experience of you, thirsty in their souls, that you would draw near to them. I pray this with great expectation, that you will do just this, because this is what you have said you will do, and you are trustworthy, you are good, and I praise your name. Thank you. Amen. 
<clears throat> Canadian Baptist Women of Ontario and Quebec exists in part to facilitate authentic experience with God. And this is what compels us year after year. We stand on the revelation of God as one who deeply desires to be in relationship with us. We stand on the promise of scripture that when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. We believe that his invitation to know him intimately as Savior, Lord, Messiah, living water is available to every single one. We believe that he is the good shepherd who never leaves our side and that we can live daily in intimate, authentic, genuine, firsthand relationship with him. If you find yourself in need of resources that will help you to facilitate your own or your groups, come and see Faith. Please reach out, please reach out and it'll be our pleasure to <clears throat> assist you in this way. God bless. Wendy and Sue for their uplifting music. What a wonderful, inspiring time that was. Also, a special thank you to Helena Berger 
for her uplifting message. And to find a little more about Helena and, and her walk with the Lord. I will now close in prayer. Dear Father, we are so thankful for the wonderful ladies that have participated in this fall wrap today. And I want to thank the technicians that have put it all together for us. We ask your blessings on all of them and all the people watching at home. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, ladies, um, this is our fall wrap, but I hope that you have enjoyed being with us um, as much as what I have enjoyed uh, watching our fall wrap series. And uh, the word that came to me this morning um, as I thought of our fall wrap and as I've watched uh, what has taken place today is Isaiah 55 verse 11. So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which it was sent. And um, Sue Gerard started off our fall wrap this morning with, and he saw me. And I thought of the woman at the well 2,000 years ago where nobody was around. But Jesus knew before that she was going to come to that well. And he planned it that he would have his time to talk to her and for her to talk to him alone. And if we had a, had this in a, in a church or together, we would not have been like this woman who sat by the well, but we have sat in our homes in our chair and we have listened to Helena Bergen and to the worship team, to the devotion this morning. And I believe that God designed this for you today. You are the woman at the well in your own home. And all these years later, I believe that God knew that this fall wrap was going to take place and that he placed in Helena's heart what to speak on. And he has made a promise that the word he has sent to you will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish where he sent it. So I hope and pray for each one of you this morning that you will receive the word today, that you will receive what has taken place and that you will know beyond any shadow of a doubt that God has met with you this morning, that he desires, he wants to talk to you just like he did to the woman at the well. He wants you to talk to him just like she did. And so I'm going to leave it with you and I just pray God's blessing upon each and every one of you. And I pray that the day is ahead that you will remember this morning and that God would continue to minister unto you and uh, that uh, you would find a greater walk in him. God bless and thank each and every one of you for taking part this morning. God bless. The steadfast love of the Lord.